Thanks, Barry. Look, if I got up here and said that the Australian industry was predominantly about hot rocks, I'd probably have about half the industry leave the association. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, you, you've actually given me a, a good intro to my first diagram, so I don't think we've got a pointer here, have we? Um, the Australian Geothermal Energy um, Association represents the major developers and explorers for, uh, of geothermal energy, and there's about 54 licence holders um, across, the, across the country, and they're looking to do a range of things. Uh, there's no single um, uh, a focus. Every geological setting is different and every approach will be different. But Barry's quite right. The, the volcanic uh, diagram, or the, di the diagram showing the volcanic uh, system on that, your left. Um, it is, there's about 10,000 megawatts of installed volcanic or conventional geothermal uh, systems operating around the world now, mostly around the Pacific Rim in Iceland, uh, down the west coast of the, U the US, of course, where there's a volcanic uh, resource to heat the, the fairly soft sedimentary sandstones. And it's fairly, you know, it's not difficult to circulate uh, uh, the waters through there and uh, bring them up to the sur surface where you drive a turbine. Um, the, the middle diagram, the hot sedimentary aquifer, that's sort of a combination between the conventional system and the, the EGS system. And there are a number of these systems operating already down the, uh, the west coast um, of the US particularly, where the, the heat source is not the volcanic um, resource, it's the underground, underlying granite below the, um, the sandstone. And then this is, this is the, the third system is what we're quite well known for in Australia and for pioneering in Australia. And, we sort of tend to cringe when we talk about Australia having a leadership position or Australia being a leader or Australia knowing something more than somebody else. And it's, it's, um, it's really often hard to prove your, prove your case that you do know more, but we have the best resource in the world running up through the east of South Australia for trial, uh, trialling and developing these enhanced geothermal systems or hot rocks. So you're actually drilling uh, uh, through the sandstone insulators. You've got to have a, an area where you've got a good insulator. You drill through the insulator and into the, the granite bedrock four or five kilometres um, uh, down from the surface. And then you send uh, uh, water down and fracture the rocks, see where the fractures go, drill your, drill your next well. So then, in, in effect, you have an injection and production well circulating. And you, until you do the fracturing, you're not really sure where you're going to put your second well. Um, the only company in Australia who's got to this point thus far is... Uh, is geodynamics in the Cooper Basin. Um, this is, a, this is a, the heat map produced by Geoscience Australia. It shows you um, what we know about where it's hot. So those red areas are generally where it's very hot above 200 uh, degrees centigrade at the five kilometres. What we don't know is where there are red spots that um, aren't shown on the map because all this, or most of this uh, data is taken from oil and gas wells. I mean, you know, we've talked earlier about how we uh, learn from other industries. Well, this industry is really learning a lot from the conventional geothermal industry and also from the oil and gas sector where they know how to drill deep holes and they know how to fracture stimulate reservoirs to make them flow. Um, the the ge geodynamics um, uh, project is in the middle of that big red blob, uh, sort of roughly around where you think Inaminka might be. Uh, there's another advanced project now halfway between Inaminka and Adelaide at uh, Paralana, the, the Petrotherm project, Petrotherm are an Adelaide based company. And so two of, the, two of the sort of leaders in the projects around the world are here in South Australia. It's a third project underway now um, in Panola where that, uh, I suppose you've got that yellow area. Uh, we'll probably fill that in a bit with a bit more um, density for the yellow in the, in the future from the readings that, that are coming out down there. Um, but they're going into the, that's the hot sedimentary aquifer one, the, the middle project, uh, sorry, the middle um, diagram project because there's a, a very large uh, sort of sandstone basin called the Otway Basin across the south of South Australia and into Victoria. So we've got a number of projects on the drawing board are about to commence drilling uh, in, across the Otway. Um, as I said, there's 54 companies. Um, two of the utilities have really bought into the industry fairly big time now. Origin Energy have a substantial investment in geodynamics, I think up to the tune of around $200 million. Uh, True Energy, a Victorian, oh, sort of a Hong Kong based, but uh, in Australia they're based in Victoria. They have a, a substantial investment in Petrotherm, but we obviously need a lot more um, investment from the utilities and from government before the industry is really going to take off. I think many of us would argue that it's access to funding, not necessarily access to technical capability that's holding the industry up. 
we, we did survive the financial crisis with the uh, 10 companies that are ASX listed in the industry. None of them fell over over the last two years, which is a pretty big uh, achievement, really, if you look at, at the capital, um, you know, the market cap of these companies and what they're trying to do. I mean, they need to raise, um, you know, 30, 30 million dollars just to show that they've got a project. The government gives you sort of seven million dollars of that, so you've still got to raise 23 million dollars in, in what is a, a very high risk project at the start. It's not easy in the current financial uh, market. As I said, there's a, um, uh, there's a, a geodynamics have already drilled there, deep wells, they've proved their concept, uh, proof of concept, they've circulated for I think about six weeks, uh, but they you may know they had a problem with the, uh, the the material specification for their well, and they got hydrogen embrittlement in the um, in the lining when they circulated, and the the well didn't do so well. But what we got out of that that sort of fairly small um, pressure event was a proof that there's a massive resource because if you saw the water and all the steam spewing up from the uh, from the well, it was a very spectacular sight. Um, so we know we've got a good resource to drive some turbines. So far, there's about $2.9 billion committed in work plans in the industry. If you want to um, get a licence, you have to register a work plan with the state regulator and you have to show what you're going to do and how much it's going to cost. So there's about $2.9 billion registered with state governments around the country. And of that, we've had about 10% of that from governments uh, committed so far. Um, of how much we've the industry has actually received from government over the last three years, about $12 million. So we really are doing it on our own. The, the, you know, either side of politics would, uh, would dispute that, but uh, we certainly feel that we are. Um, national interest benefits, it's an optimum uh, resource in Australia and it's massive. You know, I showed you the heat map, it under, undermines the entire continent. Um, I mean, there are probably places where you wouldn't go and, and at the moment access to the market is, is an issue, but we think that's being resolved with some changes to the Australian energy market rules. Uh, the, 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 the Rudd government held an, a, a, a review of the um, energy market rules in light of the carbon, you know, the need to reduce carbon from our, um, uh, from our energy generation and they've come up with some new ideas about how we can spread the cost of developing transmission lines to, uh, you know, to the areas where the renewable resources uh, will or are and uh, those recommendations have to go to a ministerial council later this year. Um, of course it's emissions free. There's a thing called base load, it just means that geothermal operates sort of 24-7, you don't turn it off except to maintain it, so it has a capacity factor of about 95%, which is pretty similar to a coal-fired, yeah, a coal uh, capacity factor, whereas a lot of the... Uh, you have to be careful, I don't like to talk about other renewables as being sort of, you know, less optimum, and, uh, and we're all right, everybody's right, there's no silver bullet, we need a whole range of these sorts of um, technologies until we get to the point where we have a sustainable um, energy mix in Australia and we're a long, long way off that. So I think all our technologies and, and the others that, uh, that this series is looking at will all be needed in the mix. The other thing that we do in Australia, and this is another, um, sort of, it's a bit of a no-brainer, direct use, using the, the heat directly um, for heating and cooling, industrial applications, not, tra not developing it or, you know, transforming it into electricity, very high efficiency or much higher efficiencies than transforming it into electricity. We're really looking to do that in WA, parts of Sydney and, and Victoria where the, the underlying sandstone basins in areas where there's high demand are, are suitable. We don't know whether or not that's going to be the case in Adelaide, but certainly it's a big, very low cost option. And these systems run through Europe now. I mean, it is a no-brainer. It's just a fact that uh, our construction and building industries aren't used to um, you know, to these sorts of um, systems. And I'll just show you why we think we've got a, a, a low environmental footprint. That's a model of, um, of the geodynamics power plant uh, near Inaminka. It's really, f I mean, we would argue that it's relatively b benign. It's not very tall. You've got the above ground piping and you've got the cooling towers on the side. It's, um, it's uh, pretty dull really, which is how, how we want it to be. Uh, this is a this is a, just an I, I guess we consider this to be a very important graph. This was released by Geoscience Australia in March this year, and it shows you, you really I don't think you can read it all that well. It shows the cheapest of all clean energy systems um, by 2030 being the hot sedimentary aquifer projects that I talked about earlier across the Otway Basin, and uh, particularly and uh, emissions free. We think that so there'll be no carbon in, in position. We think that's a pretty good deal. The third dot along that uh, um, y, is it y axis, x axis, I think it's a long time since I did, uh, along that, yeah, that axis is, um, is the, the hot rocks, the, uh, the EGS system. So we're going to be pretty cheap in the overall mix. 
Uh, we think that, um, that we're a pretty good bet and we really believe that the governments, need to, governments around the country need to get behind the industry a lot more. And the response that we get is just such a good deal, why do we have to help you? You know, we think you're going to make it. Um, we try and explain how the investment sector responds to our approaches and they say, we think you're a pretty good deal, but we actually want to see that you can pull the resource out of the ground and then we'll put our, you know, very v valuable, um, and in fact, I had a, a, some, a, a fellow who runs a, I won't name him, a fellow who runs a superannuation fund nationally said to me, would you want me to put your superannuation into your pro one of your projects at the moment? And it is until we prove those first few projects, show that you can extract the, the heat and, uh, and drive a commercial project, until we get to that point, we really are facing significant challenges getting private capital into the projects. So I think that's, oh, that, I just thought by now you want some light relief. This is a picture of ha um, Habanaro 2. It was Geodynamic's second well in the uh, Cooper Basin. And, and again, it's a, you'd think you're on the moon, perhaps, if it wasn't for that shrub. Um, but it's just showing you the, uh, that, was the, that was the well they had a problem with. They dropped a, um, a plug down the well, so they had to re-drill it. I mean, we're learning. You know, they've, got to learn, they've got to learn to run before um, industries around the world are, or companies around the world are, are learning to walk because they've got the best resource in the world. It's the highest pressure. The continent's under compression. It's a fabulous project. But we've got a few technical challenges ahead of us. Thanks, so, was that seven minutes? <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think it was good to conclude on that point. That there is, it's got a lot of potential, but there's still a long way to go. And you know, talking about speculative energy prices in 2030, you, know, you could have someone talking about cold fusion and how cheap that was going to be as well. We really won't know until we're, until we've deployed this on a reasonable scale. So I, I like think to that's use that because be it, it was a government graph, not one of ours. So that's why I like yeah. to roll it out. <laughs> um, okay, but, but looking at the shorter term, say, by 2020, we've got this mandatory renewable energy target of. 45,000 gigawatt hours per year delivered. Now let's say we could allocate 10% of that, being optimistic, to, mm -hmm. to geothermal by 2020. That would still be around 500 megawatts of average power output. Do you think that's conceivable to get that by 2020? Well, we've, you can't go to government these days without having spent a bit of money on analysis and on, you know, sort of how much, are you going, how, much, how much of your product can you produce by a certain timeline and how much, of your product, or how much is it going to cost to produce your product, product by that timeline. And everybody's focused on 2020 because that's when the renewable energy target has to be met. So we went to the government's modellers and we asked them how much do you think these are, this is our work plans, go and check with all the state regulators that they did. And uh, they predicted about 2,200 megawatts by 2020. Now, if I'm right, that's a, that was about, that's a fair whack of the measure. Steve, do you, can you do that, that maths in your head? I think it's more than, it's more <laughs> that's, than 20%. That's about half of it. I, th um, I, think, but I think we determined it was about 40% of the measure. Now, but we given that you've delivered not a single electron to the grid, that's so well, just, that if, if you let me finish, optimistic. <laughs> that, that we, they, they had a range, that was the top end of the range. So, of course, we, with the Industry Association, we talk about the top end of the range. The bottom of, end of the range was 1,000 megawatts. So, um, but I, I think we, we then got to SKM to, to update that for us last year because you know, you can't, you can't be too stale in this business. And they reviewed it and they said perhaps up to 2,400 megawatts. But in terms of the time it takes to identify the sites, drill the wells, that's what we have to do. We have to drill a lot of wells and we have to get the cost down. And that's where a lot of the research has to go into improve drilling um, technologies. And again, we take a lot of that from the oil and gas sector and a lot of that work's going on in the US, not because the Australian geothermal energy industry exists. We've got to get those costs down. But we are very much concerned as an industry that our timeline's slipping. Over the last two years, there's been very little action. There's been very little additional commitment of funding from, from, from government. And, um, you know, we've had these two big, uh, I suppose, problems at, uh, at Inaminka that have seriously held the rest of the industry up. Because government says that to us. You haven't produced it. Uh, well, it's not fair to say we haven't produced any electricity because there's a hot sedimentary aquifer project operating and has been operating since the 70s, um, Birdsville, owned and operated by the Queensland government. So, you know, we've proved that it works, but you would hardly call that system, and it's only a matter of sort of tens of kilowatts, uh, you can hardly call that a, a um, you know, a big system in terms of where we need to go. All right, if we took that lower estimate of 1,000 megawatts, um, and we consider that one pair of drill holes might generate around five megawatts of, of electricity, that's around 200 of those drill holes, mm -hmm. uh, pairs, so 400, drill holes um, by, by, that, by 2020. How many can you drill per year right now? 
depends on how many rigs you've got. At the moment, we've got, you got? Um, at the moment we've got one rig. Yeah. We've got one rig because you can't get a. Well, we've had, we've got one, and one on, one's on the way out, and one that's on the way in. Geodynamics bought their own rig. It cost them about thirty-five million dollars just to buy, for a little company to go out and buy a rig. They've got a new, bigger, better rig coming, and that's costing them upward of forty million dollars. Um, Petrotherm for their uh, project couldn't use geodynamics rig because it was busy doing geodynamics projects, so they bought in another, um, the identical rig, and uh, that cost them $5 million to just to get it to their site. You actually have to pay the mobilisation costs. You're a little company, you get $7 million from the government, and you pay $5 million to get the rig to your site. And then it literally costs you tens of thousands of dollars a day. Petrotherm went over time. I think they took about four months to drill that rig because it was the very first time. It was a brand new rig built for Australia, built for this, you know, for this industry in Australia. Um, it came here. It took. I think it. I think it took three to four months to drill that well. We've got to get. We've got to have more than half that. We've got to get that time down. But it was the first time the well was used. The rig was used. Then they. Um, it went down to Panax. It got loaded onto 112 trucks or something. Um, and it rained in the middle of Australia, and it rained, and the, the trucks were bogged for something like three weeks. Every day, those that rig, that rig is disassembled on 112 trucks. Cost the next company something like you know again thousands and thousands of dollars a day. It cost I think it ex ended up costing an extra two million dollars to to Panax in the southeast to get the rig down there because of the rain. I mean these this is the scope of the the costs that we face that are not necessarily of our own making. And now that rig has got nowhere to go because there's been a delay in, in organising the, or in finalising the contracts for the second round of geothermal drilling fund money. Um, that $7 million that I talked about the government um, gives you, yeah, they announced the second round successful applicants in December. They've only seen the contracts in the last, um, the last two months. So the financial markets have lost interest. The Weatherford have said, well, we've given up waiting for you to drill the next rig and the rig's going. And, and based on, on the figures you've just said, it sounds like you're going to need 20 to 30 of those absolutely, rigs. Absolutely, absolutely. To, to have any chance of even meeting the lower end target. So That's right. It's pretty optimistic. It's optimistic. It, it's not optimistic if you think about what we actually have to do on the ground. It's optimistic uh, if we think we're going to get the money to uh, do it. Financial. And if government doesn't step up, um, I mean, we, we had a fab fabulous meeting with the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Resources, Energy and Tourism, the one that fell on the fellows who keeps saying to us, you haven't produced any electricity yet. And one of our guys said, you're going to have an oh shit moment in about three years' time when you realise you haven't put anything like enough money into the development of, you know, of our industry. Of course, we were particularly talking to him about, but in, into the development of the, the entire sort of sustainable energy sector in Australia. Um, because we're going to get to the point, and Grant King, he's, he's not from the renewable energy industry. Grant King, the managing director of Origin, likes to talk about the fact that we have to start planning for the next round of baseload power stations, as not only as demand rises, but as we start to take the old power stations out of the market over time. There's nobody planning for this. The it's, left to, it's left to the market to plan, and there's going to be nothing clean to build. And we obviously would present the case that we are a very good <laughs> sort of option to invest in, um, because we, we tick all the boxes. Mm. Um, and then you've got to get the power to the grid as well. So that's a challenge you face um, along with solar, for instance. Well, it's a, challenge, it's a challenge that any renewable project faces because a lot of our projects are under the grid. The, the Panola project, the Geelong project, the Warrnambool project, they're all under the grid. But they've still got to get access to the grid. And, and one of the things that we're concerned about is at the moment you've got to take wind when, you know, wind is, um, you've got to take it when it's operating. And we'll, be, we'll actually be shut out potentially by wind. And unless, unless we can go to a um, uh, to someone to you know, to a retailer to sell our uh, uh, power, um, we can't do that if we if we think we're going to be locked out. For the or if they're, if they're not convinced that we won't be locked out, um, for the Inaminka project and the Paralana project and the other licensees in in the in the north of South Australia, the new Australian Energy Market uh, rule change, if it's if it's accepted by the Ministerial Council on Energy, uh, should prov should overcome our problem. Basically, what it does is it allows it's elect is it Electronet or it's a utilities? Who builds the it's Electronet in South Australia, isn't it? If, if, they're if they're allowed to build the line to Inaminka and pick up all the other, whether they're solar, geothermal, or any other form of, um, of renewable gas, potentially, um, um, for, for, we're talking about co firing with, or using gas to improve the efficiency of geothermal projects or solar projects in those regions. Bringing that power down 
Um, it allows them to spread the cost of that infrastructure over the entire national market, which solves our problem. Just finally, a couple of technical points on, on the technology itself. That's, you know, that's unfair. Uh, <laughs> yeah. right, I, I won't go into too much detail. <laughs> but, I mean, obviously it works by fracturing rock deep underground mm -hmm. and then creating a, a water circuit that, that will flow through to generate steam. Um, but how confident to date are, are, the, are the, the technologists that they can maintain a reasonably closed water circuit and stop those cracks mineralising in just a few months or a few years? You know, once you drill a pair of wells, is it going to last 10, 20 years or is it going to cool down, seize up, or are you going to lose your water? And how confident can we be in this sort of technology? I suppose there's so many parts to that question in terms of will it last 20 years. They're only designed to last probably about, it's only expected that they'll last about 20 years and then it'll be like farming, we'll go to the next well. I mean, to keep a, you know, a, a geothermal power plant going, you will be sort of developing well fields for, for decades, centuries to come. Um, as, as one area uh, cools down, you're going to develop another area and that's why geodynamics have got, um, I don't know how, how many thousands of, um, of square kilometres in, within their licences because they see they'll be able to pull several thousand um, megawatts out of their whole field, but and it has to be, you know, it has to be developed over time. In terms of um, maintaining the water pressure, absolutely right. But you d they do it in the oil and gas sector all the time, and your university is um, is probably one of the pioneers that has the opportunity to take this know-how to the world once we're once we're happier with it. But uh, certainly, at the moment, Geodynamics is the only company that have proved a sustained circulation over a period of, any period of time in Australia. But there are a number of plants operating in Italy, in France, in Germany. There's nearly one operating in Switzerland. Um, and there was one at Fenton Hill in the US that operated for, um, for over a decade. And the Fenton Hill project came out of the oil shock in the, of the 70s that, um, that Alan was talking about. Uh, the US government decided then to invest um, um, uh, some money in trialling the EGS. And Fenton Hill did run, I'm, I'm, I understand, for over 10 years. So that's the best, that's the best we have to show for it. To play a devil's advocate, and um, and Steve asked me this question before, what stopped the Swiss project? Would you enlighten me? The Swiss project. Yeah. The Swiss project was stopped by um, the rattling of the teacups in people's lounge rooms when they did the underground fracture stimulation. Um, there's a lot of lessons for Australia in that. The uh, it, the industry didn't tell people what was coming. The industry didn't explain. I don't know if you, many of you remember the earthquake we had here at the um, at the beginning of the year. Uh, I'd, I'd just just got into bed and, and it was just one of those wonderful moments where I'm just sort of, my husband had fallen asleep, I was just grabbing the, fo the Foxtel remote thinking now I've got it all to myself and I could feel this rumbling coming and I thought, God, you know, I must remember this because this is what people, this is what people may feel from some of our projects. I really wanted to understand how significant it was and it was significant. It was, a, it was like a train was coming underneath the house. Now the, I think it was a 3.8 on the Richter scale. That's the, that's the, I think Geodynamics' worst um, seismic impact in, in Aminka was 3.7. So people will feel stuff, and we have to explain it to them that it's going to be coming. We have to explain to them what it is, otherwise they'll shut us down too. We have the advantage, uh, if, we, if you're in Aminka, they've got a very good relationship with the Aminka community, and they understand what's happening. Um, if we're one of the areas where we're going to be a lot more nervous is Geelong. There's a project about, um, there's a project about um, 15, 20 minutes to the, this side of Geelong. That's, there's a lot of work going on with the local community now to tell them what's going to happen and to tell them what to expect. With those projects, we might not have to fracture. Uh, if we can get the flow through the sandstone without having to do any underground fracturing, that'll be a great bonus. OK, thanks for being on the grill there, Susan. I appreciate that. Um, thank you.